I'm Florence Doria, the, the curator of Parcours uh, for the third time. Um, it's my third edition of Parcours. Just a little um, introduction to what Parcours is. It's uh, the section of the fair that um, allows us to work within the city of Basel in order to anchor works for the whole duration of the, of the fair, which is for us five days, within the city itself. So Parcours was created in 2010 and um, the first location that was chosen was the location where Parkour takes place this year. So we're, in a way, going back to where it started because each year since 2010, Parkour was taking place in a different area of the city. So obviously, therefore, all the projects were extremely different uh, because the location itself was very um, different. So this year, 23 projects are being exhibited until tomorrow night, until Sunday night. Uh, 23 projects all around this area, uh, which is located between the two bridges that lead to uh, the fair, uh, basically around the Cathedral of Basel up to the Town Hall of Basel. Later today, uh, oh, just to mention that it's the, uh, the section which is free and open to all. And um, later today, from 6 o'clock, um, there will be Parkour Night, which is a, a program of special performances in the public space, um, with um, at 6:30, Erka Nissinen uh, will be performed at um, 6:30 and at 9 p.m. at the Scala Basel. Uh, at 7 p.m., Lara Schnitger's procession parade um, demonstration will take place in the streets of Basel. We're going to talk about all those projects, as well as Ciprian Moresan's performance taking place uh, at 7:30 and at 10 p.m. later. Julien Bismuth will present his performance, new performance at 8 p.m. At 8.30, Alexandra Bazetsis, uh, who participate in POCO, will also have a presentation, a last presentation of her work. And from 9.30, on a stage which has been installed on Munsterplatz, Rosa Barba, Edwin van der Eide, and Arun Mirza, together with a factory, factory floor, sorry, will perform. So it's a whole very, very long and rich evening of performances which uh, are going to take place on and around Munsterplatz. So in total, 26 artists have participated in uh, Parkour and Parkour Night this year. It's twice as many projects as in, as in previous years. And I'm very happy to introduce you four of the artists who are participating. So immediately next to me, Ciprian Moresan, Julien Bismuth, Erka Nissinen, and Lara Schnitger. So to start with uh, Ciprian Moresan, just uh, very quickly um, to introduce his work, uh, um, we can say that Ciprian essentially um, appropriate and recontextualize uh, historical, political, uh, social and cultural references in order to explore the mechanisms of cultural diffusion. And very often in his work, he uses um, simple gestures and popular culture as a method in order to produce works which uh, put the emphasis on the importance of uh, personal expression and uh, experience. So I'm going to um, let, give the microphone to Ciprian to let him speak about the project that he developed for Paco. Thank you. Um. So, uh, I was, uh, yeah, we choose the, 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 this location, special location, um, the uh, marionette and uh, theater. And, um, <coughs> it's okay? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. And um, uh, for this, I, I was thinking to, to, to propose a project, a uh, theater play, a puppet theater play. So, um, in, in um i ha i still i have uh, some another i have other works works with theater play and um with puppet theater play and um but for i i was thinking to do not to to use the old one or old uh, work but to to do something new and um um my idea was very simple i uh, what what how every artist is thinking how to start a project i was thinking to the kids, how they start maybe stories and ideas, and and then uh, I contact two puppeteers uh, who had um, uh, who had by chance their workshop with a, a very young uh, 
kids uh, between four years old and six years old, six, uh, six uh, years old, and uh, they were um, already doing uh, like ac acting classes. And um, my idea was to just to give them some puppets uh, without very neutral and to uh, ask them to start. Uh, I mean, to invent or to make, to build something, to build a story, and and uh, I was very interested in in uh, kids that they don't, they were not so well. Um, I said they don't have knowledge about the theater, puppet theater play, uh, plays. So they were um, somehow very. They because at four years old, it's not so uh, easy to to go to the to the with the kid at the theater play. The puppet interview. Some um, could be scary a little bit, and I guess um, so. We choose this very young age, and um, from uh, from these uh, workshops, we we um, somehow generate some uh, some material, and we we took some uh, we took some uh, small parts, uh, very short parts, and we we build a text, uh, and uh, in, uh, with this text, we we did uh, we we did. Uh, the play. So the starting point was um, the discovery of the existence of this uh, puppet theater of Basel on the location of Porco, and that's when we started discussing the possibility to commission a new work for uh, from uh, Ciprian, and um, eventually we can say that it's a, a play written by children for adults that is uh, being offered through this project. I'm going to. Um, in a minute, pass the, the microphone to Julien Bismuth. So a few words about Julien, who also in his work often uses um, performance and the performances sorry, and, uh, and theater. Um, and in his work combines uh, written and oral language objects, text and sound, etc. And uh, for this performance, which he created specifically for parkour, parkour night, um, Julien has been collaborating with an actor who speaks Romanche, a, a language which is uh, obviously linked to uh, this country because it's one of the four national languages. <coughs> um, the performance is called Dub, but I think it's more interesting if you tell us how you developed this project, knowing that it was in the very specific context of Parkour Night and the, as I said earlier, um, installation by Art Basel of a stage on the Musterplatz. Uh, thank you. I, the, um, the project started with a very uh, uh, simple thing, a simple idea, which is that, that one of the very interesting things about Switzerland is its linguistic diversity. Um, there are four national languages, French, German, Italian, and Romanche. And, uh, there's, they coexist, and the diversity is, is shared. Uh, un unlike Belgium, where the diversity can create conflict and scission, it, it's, here it's, it's, I mean, it can, but, but people who speak one language tend to speak some of the others. Um, and I was interested in, in Romanche because Romanche, like Ladine, which is sp spoken in it Italy in the Dolomites, um, come from a group of languages that are derived from the spoken Latin of the Roman Empire. So it's in a way the, the first vulgar tongue, but it's the vulgar tongue of Latin. And um, over the years, Romanche incorporated words from Celtic, from Raetic, from German, uh, more recently from Italian and other Romance languages. And um, the third thing that's interesting about the Romanche, or the other thing that's, last thing that's interesting about Romanche is that uh, unlike S Swiss German or Swiss French, and I, I think maybe Swiss Italian, but I'm not sure, um, there's no single form that's taught in schools. Uh, there was a project to, there are five idioms of Romanche, and uh, within each idiom there are several dialects. Sometimes a dialect can be uh, a difference of dialect can be simply two villages that are close by, uh, speak two different dialects. And the differences are strong enough that it's hard for people who speak different idioms of Romanche to understand each other. Um, so uh, I, I'm not exactly sure when, I think 30 years ago or so, uh, a linguist 
tried to create a common form of romanche called Romanche Grishun, um, and tried to make that the, the form of romanche that would be taught in schools. And it, it hasn't quite worked, it led to actually in this case a lot of conflict. Um, so all those facts aside, what, what, what I found beautiful about this language is that it, it shows a very simple but incredibly mysterious and beautiful fact about language, which is that within a group of people who speak the same language, whenever a distance is created, uh, whenever two people, uh, two groups within a group, smaller groups are formed, either because the groups separate and move apart or because, uh, as you see in cities, there are differences of class, or even di differences of profession, um, or differences of age, language changes. Uh, teenagers have their slang, uh, carpenters have their, their lingo, um, and, and, and within a city like London, for example, you have different dialects, or maybe less so now, but you have different forms of English that are spoken within the city, depending on the neighborhood. And, and Romain shows that in a, in, a, in a very beautiful way, even though it's, a, it's a, the, actually the, the least spoken language in Switzerland, but it has preserved its diversity. And I, I find this diversity very beautiful and compelling because it's also something that's threatened um, in today's culture, in today's world, where communication is so much more instantaneous, um, English has become a kind of de facto Esperanto for, as you have seen throughout this week in the fair, for all of us. Um, and so it's, it's incredibly difficult to preserve these differences because for a very simple reason, which is that distances are more and more abolished by technology, by the way we work, by the way we travel. Um, so that's for the, the, the inspiration for the piece. The piece itself, uh, you'll see if you come, is very simple. I'm, I'm asking uh, Roman, the name of the actor is Roman, to speak in Romanche for 40 minutes, uh, which is a long time, but I imagine that people will be walking past or in and out or stopping, talking, looking. And behind him, a series of texts, very short texts in English will be projected, which will describe the dynamic of the piece and basically say that his, his speech is in, improvised um, what he's saying is the fruit of discussions and conversations. Yeah, that I we think had. you should give some secrets. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. So that's the piece. Yeah, and the inspiration. Pardon. I mean, we, you can't spoil it all. <laughs> um, no, so to get back to being serious, which is the opposite of uh, Erkan Nissinen's, um, what, why <laughs> Erkan Nissinen's work is so known. In fact, his work has been said to be characterized by a melancholy seriousness and graceful clumsiness, which I really liked. In fact, um, Erka uses in his work essentially videos, which are known for their humor, the sense of humor, and uh, their musicality, as well as the philosophical thematic themes uh, that he explored for um, this uh, parkour, edition of parkour. Erka has been uh, proposing this uh, projection as well as performance, which is going again to take place at the Scala Basel, the theater, uh, later at 6.30 and um, 9 p.m. Uh, the work is, called, is entitled Name Me, Me Man, Red Negative, Evita Gender, which is very mysterious. We can't wait to hear all about this choice. And it's a piece which combines, as I said, the narrative video and um, a live performance by the artist himself. Erka, can you reveal, without revealing too much, what the work is about? Um, how did you work within this context of the theater? I don't know. Um, I, I never managed to get any kind of ideas. I, I try, but I, they never come. So I, it's very difficult to say what this work is about. Um, it's, uh, it's a kind of live version of a video piece, and uh, I, I usually make narrative videos where I'm performing most of the roles myself because this is the cheapest option. Um, so here I have a background projection and uh, it's a kind of theater piece where I'm playing most of the roles on uh, 
in a video background projection and one of the main characters live on stage uh, interacting with the uh, characters in the, in the video piece. Um, but it's even unclear for me what's happening in, in, the, in the story. It's, uh, it's obscure. There, there is uh, sex, violence, um, I think that's about it, yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, Larache Nidger has been, um, uh, in the context of Paco, creating a very provocative um, installation in an administrative building, which is in itself very beautiful. Again, the starting point of the discussion, the work was the discovery of this building, uh, which provides um, characteristic, very high ceiling, and the possibility to really enter a building and have a, a sort of a, um, uh, how do you say, public plaza within, within a, a, a building itself. So this um, installation, which is uh, called Suffragette City, will uh, become, well, we come to life uh, later on at 7 p.m. and um, as a, in the form of a public demonstration, which will uh, been carried uh, in the streets of, of Basel. Uh, Lara works a lot with um, fabric and with um, uh, knitted and soon textile and create textile uh, sculptures, but also sometimes videos and photographs. But um, I'm going to ask you to talk yourself about this uh, fantastic project that you've been developing. Yeah, so when I got invited to make a proposal to be part of Procure, uh, I had the idea of uh, involving the people from Basel. Um, and while working on my own work, I decided let's make a big procession slash riot slash um, protest uh, uh, about all the female. So it's kind of a female rights protest. So all the sculptures, which are actually the main character in the protest, are having a lot of slogans and sayings about some of the uh, problems females are still having these days. Um, that is one huge sculpture there. In the show, I ended up making a whole bunch of slot sticks, which come from, uh, at some point, uh, actually right now, a lot of female protests uh, are going around, are the slot parades. And these are uh, women like me and maybe you too, who feel that whatever you're wearing doesn't mean you're inviting yourself to be raped. This happened to some woman in Canada and that was a huge uh, problem, uh, of course. And then all these parades are starting up. So, my, so I made a bunch of slot sticks will be carried as well through the show, uh, through the procession. I'm not sure how to call this exactly a procession or a riot or... So we're still, before I forget, we're still looking for people to help carrying the works. Could be male and female. Oh yeah, that's good. We, you can come and participate. We will meet at 5 p.m. in front of the building where the installation is. If you yeah. would like to come, you're most invited. Yeah, uh, of course, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. We have to do this all together. And we will go through the streets of Basel and end up back in the exhibition space, which is what you said, looks like kind of an open square, but it's inside. And I'm very excited for tonight. <laughs> we all are. <laughs> so now that we uh, gave an overview of the project themselves, maybe we can talk about the, the thematics of this uh, discussion, which is performances in public space. Public space is um, um, as a wide theme, of course, we don't know how to describe what is public space, but at least we know that we oppose it to the exhibition space. So I would like to ask you, maybe we can start with you, Ciprian, how important is um, the fact that your work is uh, presented or confronted uh, to a different context of presentation? Um, <coughs> for me, actually, the first uh, public space was the where when we did the the workshops and uh, we yeah we, uh, I start to work with this let's say institution like uh, I don't know kind of school for kids uh, or uh, ki kindergarten and kind of um, alternative um, uh, because they they were uh, alternative um, classes for uh, after the the kindergarten and. Um, <coughs> And yeah, it's a confront 
adaptation with something uh, for sure, yeah, um, not, um, let's say, um, it's, it's this in, uh, at the beginning it, you feel this impossibility to explain what, uh, what is art or contemporary art uh, when you, when you get, go out from the exhibition um, space, from the, this, um, it's, and it, of course it's very, this is a banal thing, but this is the, the, the fact. When you go out a little bit from your uh, borders uh, and from these institutional uh, bo borders like exhibition space or um, you, um, you uh, just, uh, it's like a wall, you know, you have a wall of, um, and um, yeah, and for me it was interesting to, to, to find this wall and to try it with the kids then to explain uh, or and now we, in the theater play, uh, in the theater um, we, we do a theater play which doesn't look like a theater play actually and uh, and then when working with the actors and with the puppeteers was hard to explain them that this is not a, uh, we don't have to make divertisement, we have to, to do something else and to, yeah, to ju it's just a, it's just a, um, experiment and it don't, it doesn't matter if the, 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 the people go out from the, from the public uh, in the, because, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, for me, for me is this, um, let's say, challenge who, yeah, I'm still, I still uh, face it, yeah. New Julien, have you converted your work to, uh, we said that the starting point was this precise inv invitation somehow to create something uh, on a stage in the middle of a public plaza. Was it something that you already experienced before and how did you manage this? Uh, never, no, I, I've, I've rarely done things on a stage and then that's a very specific stage. Uh, I, I've done things outside or in cities um, I was in a show in Frankfurt called Playing the City where you had to do performances in, in the city, in the street. Um, and I have, it's a hard thing to talk about, but I'll be brief. But, uh, but it's, it's hard. I, I don't know because you, you don't... I, I think whether you're showing something in an institution uh, to an art public or to what you think is an art public, or you imagine to be an art public, or where you, whether you're showing something outside, you never know the, the, the filters and the codes through which people will look at your work. And uh, you never know how, how your work is gonna be framed in their mind, how much of whatever literature surrounds it they're gonna read or not or whatever. Um, so in my work, I, I try, and I, I don't know how successful I am, but I, I try to think about making something that even someone who has no, none of the codes and none of the filters that I have or that I work from, um, that he or she could get something out of it. Um, and I think when, when you start from that, then, then it, it makes things more complex, but also more simple, because there, there are forms of incomprehension that people have with contemporary modern art, which is actually completely understanding it. Uh, um, I took a class of students one time to see a show and, and they were looking at minimalist sculpture and saying that there's nothing and they're just these objects and it's, they're just in the room and they look like the room, which is actually quite a good definition of minimalism in a way, um, and, and, and a not an uninteresting one. So um, I think for, the, for this piece, I, I was trying to think of that. Uh, beyond that, I, I was also trying to think of people passing and coming and going, uh, the dynamics of the space. but. But it's it's a hard. You can't really put yourself in that position somehow completely. Okay, for you, the, the the invitation was somehow so specific. We we changed your work together somehow uh, by deciding to um, appropriate this theater in the city. Uh, can you talk about this uh, decision that you made to modify the presentation of your work in order to be able to use this theater, this uh, big theater in the city center of Basel? I, I like the space very much. Um, um, I, I have only performed a couple of times. In my, I mean, I never really perform. I, I usually make videos that are being shown in obscure video festivals somewhere. I, I'm never present. 
and uh, this kind of black box theater situation is quite nice in in terms of like um, getting this immediate feedback from the audience and like just listening to the audience and seeing what is the good stuff and uh, um, so I, you know, that's that's the nice thing. But I I I I like the I like the setup. I like the black box theater setup very much. For you, Lara, it's um, in your work. You already bring somehow things that are happening um, outside of the art world, outside of the exhibition space, and translate and bring it back inside the exhibition space. But with the demonstration, procession, parade. Again, you are obviously you need to be going out in the streets, and uh, is this something that you are familiar with? You've done uh, before in the past, and uh, intend to develop. Uh, I have done once. I've uh, been part of a procession exhibition with a lot of artists, and all the pieces went on the streets. And it was very interesting to see, uh, like most of you guys talk about, the direct reaction from the people. Because maybe it is out on the street and it is off of the museum. People quickly are say things to you. And uh, sometimes it can be very lonely being an artist and your piece is there. And nobody knows, you know, my face isn't recognized for, you know, being that person. And... Um, it's nice to get to hear from people. I always like when, I don't know, I have a leak in my studio and a plumber comes and he suddenly says a whole, his, from his perspective, something about the work, which uh, I don't know if I would hear any of these comments uh, in a museum context. So I'm always very excited about that. To hear that and be inspiring to these people or all, all people and hope that the works by making the step a little less hard uh, will communicate easier and quicker uh, to everybody. I, I was listening to what you all said, and there's something that strikes me. It is the, this specific uh, possibility that the uh, understanding, the reception, uh, the reactions created by your work being shown in public spaces instead of an exhibition space is different. Would you say that this is what it is? the interest that comes for you in uh, through from working sorry from working in public space this change in perception about your work yes uh, because the, the i mean in the exhibition space the public is uh, i mean uh, have an expectation and uh, like i said in the, in the on the theater you you are uh, you, you expect to see a Theater play, not a contemporary art, or yeah, and um, yeah, I, I don't feel safe. I mean, I, I realize that it's not so safe in the in the, which is good from yeah, in the public space. So it's it's you, you don't you are not protected by these institutions who mediate for you and you know and who yeah. Any any other one? Well, I think also the the difference is you don't. Um, when you do an exhibition in a museum or a gallery, you don't tend to hang out that much thereafter. <laughs> you kind of leave, you know, you don't, you don't really hang out the museum in front of your work, but it's true, like what you're saying, when you do something outside, you tend to be present, even if only to film, and you do hear things. And maybe it's one of the few times where you get to hear unfiltered things because no one knows who you are, you know, and, and yeah, so. I guess there's some kind of commitment on in going into theater and you have to sort of sit through the whole performance unlike in exhibition space where you it's I will never I will never look at the video piece like from beginning to the end for example it's, it never happens so there's some some kind of nice sort of concentration in that La, do you want to add something um yeah, I think that we all kind of experience some of the same things. And that's, I think, why it's exciting what we're doing. And um So we were just talking about um, the, the end of the, the public, what it is for the public, maybe what it offers as a, um, an experience to discover your work. But on your end, um, does, it, does working in public space offer you, I don't know, um, a different distance from from your work that 
offers you a different look at what you're doing? Does it work that way? For me, it's more that, um, f for sure, uh, you, yeah, you find an ad ad other, other um, let's say, other, um, um, other kind of public. I mean, not, um, yeah. You can say that exists a kind of professional public for art, and um, with this, you, you, yeah, we blow up the the, the borders, and, yeah, as as I feel it, and. I I I'm, I don't know. I I think I I, I think um, maybe I've gotten it's I've gotten thing something out of doing things in public spaces, but I've gotten a lot out of showing works to different publics, like uh, showing works in a Kak or a Frak or a Kunsthalle or Kunstverein, where you're in a smaller city or village, and you have to show the work to the people, the lo the residents, um, and the people who participate in the institution. And you have to explain yourself in a different way, and you're confronted with basic questions. I think that's that's can be a really that's another, I guess, sense of public art. Um, but yeah, I haven't done art in uh, sort of comedy stuff that I I do. It's the audiences react totally different ways. Like. Uh, sometimes they are totally hostile against it, and then sometimes they are really supportive. Um, and yeah, so it's, it offers this possibility of failure. It's, it's yeah, for me, it also really stretches my capability of making a sculpture. Mostly I work with a kind of a balancing act, and this time it has to go on the streets, being carried by people. So I have to push myself forward to make the pieces maybe more stable and make them more lasting for at least this event. So it does bring even practical new problems onto the plate, which is, uh, I think, always a good thing because something can blossom out of that in a whole other way later. Well, thank you. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have any questions, yes, over there. It's coming. I have a group that commissions public art in a small city in the U.S., and we have, we have not done much performance. We're starting to wrap it in mainly by having the artists who come do their work, uh, install their pieces, and talk about their pieces as they're doing their work. The interesting thing about performance art from our perspective is what happens when you give it and there's not an audience? I mean, when we commission a piece and there's nobody there to see it, it's still got a lot of meaning and I go and look at it and look at the big empty space in front of it. But when you have a performance piece, have there been times when there's no one to perform to and what does it, what does it do to you and your piece? I would like to say something for this. Um, I was living in Japan for a year and I was part of a performance from a Japanese artist and she had written clearly instructions what to do, what to do by rain, what to do then, what to do when nobody showed up. And that was completely part of it. I think as an artist, it, in a way, we are kind of selfish or, and we do it for ourselves. So it will happen, I think. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> If you fail, it doesn't matter because there's nobody to see it. <laughs> For me, it was um, this experience here in the theater was very good because uh, I never had such an audience. I mean, <laughs> and we actually we vi virus the th theater with this. I mean, they probably people were expecting a, a divertisement like a yeah, classic uh, puppet theater, and yeah, we. We, yeah. So, so we get advantage of this. I, I did something where I, I waited uh, as a performance in front of a public for an hour, and so the whole public left. 
uh, obviously, <laughs> um, except for the person filming. And then the employees of the space came and ate lunch in the space. And they started to clean the space, like vacuum clean the space. Um, but I, I brought that on myself. And I actually kind of enjoyed it, but I, perversely, I don't know. Any other question? We might have time for one more. How you, how you doing? Uh, I had a question. Uh, you were speaking earlier about um, the concept of like doing a performance piece uh, in a public space and not having an institution to kind of explain it or to have any type of literature. Uh, does that make your work that much more powerful? Or do you kind of find a more universal language when you're speaking uh, with works in public spaces because you don't have those, you know, um, any type of text or any type of uh, kind of introduction to what you're doing? Does it make it harder? Or does it push you in, in, in a great way? Or is sometimes it too challenging in that sense? That's to anybody or, sorry. Yeah. No in here there there were some texts i mean there were the brochures there, were, there was a text but yeah it, it, uh, as i feel it or as i, I as i um, as i saw that the people does don't, they don't really read the text as in the museums or or they, so i i talking about percentage of um, let's say um, yeah, but the the public is wider than um, wider audience than the, the, the for the museum. This is for sure. Yeah. And um, I don't know about the uh, un universal uh, language because um, I don't know. I mean, also I was um, and my 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 piece is about somehow the this uh, language like the theater language. Then the, the actors actually my actors were they were the first time they, they had to, to play in English language, so this is related also. With, with, uh, so, um, this I don't know how to answer <laughs> about, the, about the universal, because it's, it's tricky because uh, um, we build the languages, um, let's say, um, uh, all the time. I mean, it could be, I mean, could be successful to, to, to or not. Yeah. I, I think the, the problem is, is doesn't just exist in public art. It's also, I think it's also valid in an institution. It's also valid for a, a, a public that's aware. I think if you present a work that, that um, doesn't, in a way, allow for an interaction just with the work or with what the work contains, at a, you know, uh, outside of what surrounds it outside of the wall text or the, the press release um, that I think that's problematic. I think I, I, I have no I, I made a lot of works that rely on those secondary forms of literature or kind of framing devices. Um, but I think there should be a moment or there should be an aspect of the work that that pulls you in. And then it's up to the viewer to read if he or she wants to, to look into it more if they want to, or if they care to. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that's, a, that's something that's not just uh, proper to public art. For me, it's all there in the, in the work. There's nothing, nothing uh, you can read or there's nothing, you, it doesn't need to be put into context, I think. Yeah, I agree. I, for me, I think the greatest art is art without a textbook next to it. I think it should be all there. Any other questions? Well, I think we're going to stop here. Thank you so much, all of you, and uh, see you at 6.30 at Scala Basel for the beginning of Parkour Night. Thank you so much. <laughs>